to note that today the committee is meeting virtually, perhaps the last time, I hope. We want to announce a couple of reminders to the members about the conduct of this hearing. First, uh, members should please keep their video feed on as long as they're present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones, so please keep your microphones muted unless you're speaking. And finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the meeting. And before we get underway, I want to take a moment to raise what's in the back of all of our minds, the Russia-Ukraine conflict and its implications for our civil space activities. According to media reports, NASA has stated that, quote, it continues working with our international partners, including the State Space Corporation of Roscosmos, for the ongoing safe operations of the International Space Station. I'm encouraged by that and by the fact that the International Space Station partnership has been successfully preserved through periods of geopolitical stress in the past, and that sustaining its safe and productive operation has always been a focus of the partnership. That said, this committee will continue to monitor the situation and seek updates from NASA as needed. So returning now to the hearing, good morning, and welcome to today's hearing titled, Keeping Our Sights on Mars Part 3, a status update and review of NASA's Artemis Initiative. This time, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our panel of distinguished witnesses. Thank you for being here. Before I continue, I wanna take a moment to recognize the Artemis One team at Kennedy Space Center. They're working hard to prepare for Artemis One, the first launch of the integrated space launch system with the Orion crew vehicle. This is an exciting and important milestone for Artemis and we couldn't do it without them. It's been four years since President Trump first announced a return to the moon with humans, later naming the effort Artemis. And it's been nearly three years since former Vice President Pence accelerated the date for a moon landing by four years to 2024. The Biden administration is continuing Artemis, providing the important constancy of purpose for NASA's long-term exploration initiative, an initiative that will span multiple Congresses and administrations. Today's hearing will review NASA's plans and progress on Artemis, the heavy lift space launch system, the Orion crew vehicle, the ground systems, the spacesuits, the human landing system, the cislunar orbiting gateway station, and the many other systems, payloads, and operations that will support planned missions to the moon in preparation for the next giant leap, being the first nation to land humans on the surface of Mars. Our witnesses will discuss the status of Artemis and provide their perspectives on what is needed to make it successful. We need their wisdom and guidance because by all accounts, Artemis is facing significant challenges. Advisory boards, reviews, and audits are sounding warnings. Taken together, those warnings signal that the issues affecting Artemis need serious attention by both Congress and the administration. Scheduled delays and cross growth years in the making, a confusing mishmash of contract types, and untried approaches to organization and management are just a few of the concerns that have been raised. Throughout its history, NASA has repeatedly shown that it can solve hard problems. The question before us today is, are we willing, is NASA willing, to own the challenges, face them head on, and undo any problematic decisions if necessary? That is, are both NASA and we in Congress prepared to take the actions that will be needed to lead Artemis to success? Well, the answer must be a resounding yes, because I believe we have a unique opportunity in Artemis if we choose to accept it. Bipartisan support is strong. I love working with Dr. Babb and uh, Mr. Lucas and others. The desire to explore deep space with humans, once again, is palpable, and the chance to achieve is before us. What's missing are the answers to the questions. What are we trying to accomplish, and how are we going to do it? And what are our priorities? Funding, of course, will not be unlimited. Choices will need to be made. And are we establishing a sustainable lunar program of unlimited duration or are we meeting milestones and defined objectives that feed forward to enable the Mars goals? Are we developing national capabilities needed for moon to Mars or investing in commercial capabilities designed to objectives other than national needs? Is Artemis gonna be a national program or a disparate set of projects? Have we laid out a credible plan, approach, organization, and management structure and identified the resources needed to implement? Everything, everything is dependent on having a clear and agreed upon story of what we we're doing, why, and how we will get there. More than four years into Artemis, the nation's premier effort to lead America back to the moon and onto Mars, I'm still looking for that narrative, something I can tell my constituents, my family, especially my wife, and my colleagues abroad, and my colleagues here in Congress, especially the appropriators. Great nations do great things. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on what's needed 
to write an Artemis narrative that is worthy of our great nation. Let me now recognize my friend, the distinguished dentist and congressman from Houston, Mr. Dr. Babin, for an opening statement. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see all of our uh, uh, expert witnesses and panelists back uh, again and to be with uh, all of my colleagues. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and your distinguished panel of witnesses. This hearing will provide Congress with an update on the current status of the nation's deep space exploration initiatives. This panel is uniquely positioned to provide that update one theme that should emerge from this hearing is the agreement from all participants, members, and witnesses about the importance of continuity of purpose and design and architecture stability. Space exploration programs have failed because of conflicting direction, uncertain goals, and unrealistic expectations. Maintaining progress through various administrations and congresses is critical for space exploration programs. The Trump administration brought space policy back in line with congressional direction derived from the consistent and steady guidance provided by the 2005, 2008, 2010, and, and the 2017 NASA uh, Authorization Act. This meant a return to the moon and onto Mars and beyond, not an asteroid distraction directed by the Obama administration. President Biden, to his credit, has stayed the course as well so far. Hopefully, future requests will prioritize funding an expedited return to the moon, which is important to our nation geopolitically, scientifically, economically, and from a national security perspective. The moon is also a logical and achievable near-term goal that will enable uh, the future exploration of Mars. In the next few weeks, we will hopefully see a successful launch of Orion atop the Space Launch System, or SLS, derived to main critical national capabilities, NASA's facilities, infrastructure, and workforce. SLS, Orion, and Exploration Ground Systems are not just a rocket, but national capabilities that enable deep space exploration of the Moon, Mars, and our solar system. SLS and Orion for Artemis, one, are are at the Case Center right now, awaiting a wet dress rehearsal before launch this spring. Core stages and capsules for later Artemis missions are well along in production. We're also in the early stages of doing a human landing system to deliver crew to the surface of the moon, advanced space suits to replace the aging ISS suits and allow for surface operations and enabling capabilities surface power, habitats, and surface vehicles that are necessary for a robust exploratory exploration program. Finally, work on gateway in space propulsion. Other long-term capabilities are also underway and are poised to enable a sustained exploration architecture. As highlighted in the testimony, we are receiving today the novel approaches proposed for these acquisitions will require robust oversight, and insight to ensure a, a success. We've returned to the correct goal, are on the right path, but we are waiting on the right plan. And as we will hear from our witnesses, there are still many details that NASA needs to provide. We have no reliable cost for Artemis, no integrated map for Artemis and its subcomponent, and no clarity on how the integration of elements such as gateway Spacesuits, HLS, LS, Orion, and EG, uh, excuse me, EGS will happen, or who is responsible for ensuring ultimate success? NASA's new reorganization may be a step in the right direction, but many questions certainly remain. The reorganization is very similar to the previous reorganization proposal from the Trump administration, which was rejected by the majority, only to be approved by them under this new administration. Is NASA just rearranging deck chairs or will it have a real impact? Is NASA's proposed phasing of transition from development to operations appropriate? And, uh, and does it heed past safety warnings from the Columbia Accident Investigation Board on deeming spaceflight systems operational? I'm sure that we all have many more questions. 
I'm also confident that we all have the same shared goal, and that is a robo robust human space flight program. But as the saying goes, the devil is certainly in the details. We are still waiting on those details. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony today, and I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, thank you, Dr. Babin, very much. Now let me recognize the ranking chair of the, the larger whole committee, the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma, Congressman Lucas. Thank you, Chairman Byer, for holding today's hearing on the Artemis program and our efforts to send Americans back to the moon and then on to Mars. This mission is the most complex, most important that NASA has undertaken to date. It is far more ambitious than our landings more than 50 years ago in the 1960s and 70s, because this time we're going back to stay. Still, we can take lessons from that pioneering generation of space explorers. Just 66 years after the Wright brothers flew, first flew an airplane, NASA landed humans on the moon. But in the 50 years since we last walked on the moon, we've not returned, nor have we advanced further in our solar system. How did NASA go from its founding in 1958 to a moon landing in 1969? The same way we accomplish any big mission, we make it a priority. We had strong leadership, a clear vision, precise timelines, steady funding, and an incredibly talented workforce. We still have the most talented workforce in the world, but I'm concerned we're missing the rest of those variables. We are one year into the 117th Congress, and this is our first hearing on the Artemis program. We've not achieved much on space policy in general in this Congress, unfortunately. All we have to show for our work is an enhanced use leasing bill that was hijacked for a dead end federal election bill. We're back to square one on that, and we'll have to start over. As the Congressional Committee with Jurisdiction over NASA, it's our responsibility to maintain a strong space program. And specifically, we must ensure a successful Artemis program. We have to provide close oversight, clear guidance, and work with our appropriators to allocate consistent funding. I stand ready to do so. And I'd like to get to work on a NASA reauthorization bill as soon as possible. It pains me to say that our counterparts in the Senate side have made progress and passed legislation on this while we've stalled. But Congress can only do so much. NASA needs to provide us with an updated plan, a precise timeline, and a realistic budget. Simply put, tell us how long it will take, how we will do it, and how much it costs. The Artemis program must be NASA's highest priority, and I expect the administration's actions to start reflecting this. I understand it takes time for an, in to, for an incoming administration to appoint new leadership and then for them to get up to speed. But we're a year in now, and we don't even have a target date for when we can anticipate a moon landing. A recent Inspector General report made it clear that NASA will not meet its goal of landing humans on the moon in 2024. It also recommended that NASA create an integrated master schedule to identify and sequence all of the Artemis program activities. Operating with a clear and comprehensive timetable will improve efficiency and ensure we're holding to a realistic but comped deadlines. What's more, this administration has not given us realistic budget estimates for Artemis. I'm tired of the narrative that Congress isn't giving NASA the money it needs. NASA needs to give us a robust and accurate budget request so that Congress can authorize and fund appropriately. The same inspector general stated that NASA does not have a credible estimate that consolidates all of the Artemis cost across mission directories. We won't get to the moon and Mars with imprecise budgets and vague deadlines. And underestimating the cost of large missions like this doesn't serve anyone. I'd like to see this administration put forth an accurate budget request this year so we can take that into account when making funding decisions. One way to address these ongoing cost and scheduling concerns is to designate a single program manager for Artemis to integrate and coordinate the many complex elements at play. So those are the issues we must address today, cost, budget, and leadership. It is my hope that this hearing helps provide some answers to these outstanding questions. The good news is that I believe we all share the same goal. We want to return Americans to the moon as soon as possible and as safely as possible. 
and we all want to take the next giant leap in space exploration and send humans to another planet. That's why I'm hopeful we can improve how Artemis is run. I believe space exploration has value in and of itself. It's human instinct to seek knowledge and to pursue new frontiers. I also believe there are economic, technological, and national security benefits to America's space program. We have long benefited from being the leader in space, but China is making aggressive moves to expand their presence, and Vladimir Putin is acting increasingly erratic and irresponsible. At the four, at the front, as the front runner in space exploration, the U.S. established early precedents of transparency, open science, peaceful collaboration. I can assure you that the space program run by the People's Liberation Army does not share those goals. Through the Artemis Accords, the United States has pledged to work with our allies to support peaceful and cooperative exploration and research. We have made a commitment to international collaboration and the benefits of all humankind. These are the values that must guide our activity in space. I'm incredibly excited to see Artemis take off, literally and figuratively. I'm honored to serve on the committee with oversight over this historic effort. To our witnesses, thank you for being here today and sharing your expertise. I look forward to hearing more about how we can continue to strengthen and improve the efforts to return to the moon and explore Mars. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Lukes, thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Mr. James Free is the Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Director at NASA. Mr. Free is a formerly retired NASA civil servant who spent the past few years in a variety of private sector roles. Prior to retiring from NASA, he served as a leader in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate and across several NASA centers. Mr. Free earned his bachelor's degree in aeronautics from Miami University, his master's degree in space systems engineering from Delft University of Technology. Mr. William Russell will be our second speaker. He's a director in GAO's contracting and national security acquisitions team. He oversees a portfolio of issues related to NASA, DOD weapon system cybersecurity, protection of critical technologies, DOD industrial basis supply chain integrity, and defense contracting. Mr. Russell earned a master's degree in foreign affairs from the University of Virginia and a bachelor's degree in political science from Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Patricia Sanders serves as the chair of the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel. She's currently an independent aerospace consultant after having been the executive director of the Missile Defense Agency. In 2008, Dr. Sanders retired from the federal government after 34 years of service with experience in the management of complex technical programs, leadership of large and diverse organizations, and development and execution of policy at the DOD level. Mr. Paul Martin has served as NASA Inspector General since 2009. Prior to his NASA position, Mr. Martin served as the Deputy Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Justice and Deputy Staff Director at the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Mr. Martin began his professional career as a newspaper reporter in Greensville, South Carolina. He holds a BA in journalism from Pennsylvania State University and a JD from the Georgetown University of Boston. And then finally, we'll hear from Mr. Dan Dumbacher. Dan is the executive director of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, or AIAA. Before joining AIAA, Mr. Dumbacher was a professor at Purdue University and had also served for many years in leadership positions across NASA. Mr. Dumbacher earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Purdue and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. As a witness, you should know you'll each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. It's perfectly fine that your written testimony is much longer than that. And your written testimony will be included in full in the record for the hearing. When the five of you have completed your spoken testimony, we'll begin with questions. And each member will have five minutes to question the panel. So we will start with Mr. Free. Mr. Free, you have the floor. Good morning, Chairman Beyer, Ranking Member Babin, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the subcommittee. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to discuss America's next great exploration initiative, the Artemis program. It's thrilling to stand in the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center and see the rocket and spacecraft, spacecraft transformed from legislation to real hardware, about to embark upon its maiden voyage to the moon. Soon the entire vehicle will be rolled out to the pad for the wet dress rehearsal 
in preparation for the Artemis I mission later this year. This is the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will demonstrate this nation's commitment <clears throat> and capability to extend human presence to the moon and beyond. To be clear, NASA's long-term goal is to send humans to Mars, and we will use the, Mar the moon to help us get there. We could have not have gotten here without the steadfast bipartisan support of Congress, starting with the NASA Authorization Act of 2010 and followed by the NASA Transition Author Authorization Act of 2017, Congress established a clear vision for NASA to extend human presence beyond low Earth orbit. Following this year's uncrewed Artemis I test demonstration flight, NASA will conduct a crewed demonstration flight around the moon in 2024 to demonstrate performance of the Orion crew capsule and the non-rectilinear halo orbit. No earlier than 2025, NASA will launch Artemis III, which will return U.S. astronauts to the moon. During this mission, the astronauts will leave Orion and board the human lander, lander system, which will deliver two crew members to the surface of the moon. The next generation of moonwalkers will be much more diverse as NASA's Artemis program will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. NASA is also developing the Gateway, a lunar space station that will serve as an orbital platform supporting future human and robotic missions to science and resource rich areas on the lunar surface, as well as our preparation for Mars. The Gateway is also a continued demonstration of NASA's commitment to international cooperation in the Artemis program, extending our international partnerships from low Earth orbit. NASA has also begun to work with commercial space industry to obtain new spacesuits. Under this new program, NASA will continue to lever leverage its center expertise on spacewalk systems, spacesuits, and operational concepts. Building upon the work done by the Apollo missions, NASA will work to make this exploration effort more sustainable with help of newer technologies, as well as innovative commercial and international partnerships, all while advancing principles for peaceful and sustainable space exploration through the Artemis Accords. Through Artemis, NASA will continue to be at the forefront of humanity's quest for knowledge. NASA plans to send more robots and humans to study more of the moon than ever before, where we will learn how to live far away from Earth for longer periods of time. We will make new scientific discoveries and gain a better understanding of how much water and other resources are available on the moon to help build the first long-term presence on the surface of the moon. As much as possible, our technologies and operations will be designed for use on both moon and Mars, all supporting our long-term goal of sending the first astronauts to the red planet. Every bit of work that I've mentioned is possible because of the people of NASA and our private sector partners. Our people have delivered despite COVID, which includes losing some of our teammates because of the virus. They've come to work while their homes were damaged and without power due to severe storms. They've come with the spirit of exploration that has and always will be as tangible as the hardware. I'm grateful to be able to represent them here. Thank you for the first of what I hope to be numerous interactions to help explain our plans, how we can, can, can continue to work together, and most importantly, share our progress taking humanity further into the solar system. Thank you. Mr. Free, thank you very much. We'll next hear from Mr. Russell. The floor is yours. Chairman Beyer, Ranking Member Babin, Ranking Member Lucas, members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss NASA's efforts to return astronauts to the surface of the moon and ultimately human exploration of Mars through its Artemis missions. NASA requested at least 32 billion over the next five years to support this ambitious undertaking. Since 2017, NASA has been developing eight highly complex and interdependent lunar programs. These include a human landing system to support transport crew to the surface of the moon and spacesuits for lunar operations. In addition, NASA plans to rely on existing programs, including the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle and the space launch system to launch and transport crew. Successfully executing the Artemis missions will require extensive coordination across programs and with a wide range of contractors to ensure systems operate together seamlessly and safely. Our work has highlighted NASA's progress. 
For example, NASA is conducting final integration and test activities for Artemis 1. NASA is also making progress acquiring hardware needed for Artemis 2. In terms of Artemis 3, NASA is completing planning activities such as updating requirements and implementing our recommendation to schedule integration reviews that help ensure coordination of individual lunar programs to support the overall Artemis 3 mission. While NASA continues to make progress, the agency still faces a number of challenges related to schedule, cost, technology development, and management. For example, the Artemis 3 schedule remains challenging. NASA now plans to conduct the Artemis 3 moon landing mission no earlier than 2025, a year later than originally planned, but the schedule remains challenging. For example, the seven month delay in working on HLS increases schedule risks as the program already planned to develop and launch the system months faster than other spaceflight programs and will need to mature critical technologies along the way. In July, 2021, NASA also approved a change from developing its new space suits from an in-house approach to using a contractor, which may also affect plan timeframes. There are also increasing costs. Key Artemis III programs have experienced cost growth. For example, costs for the space launch system and ground systems grew by more than 1 billion in 2020. In addition, transparency of, of costs could be improved. For example, SLS costs are not captured beyond Artemis I, and Orion costs are not captured beyond Artemis II. We recommended that NASA create an Artemis III mission cost estimate, and NASA plans to do so later in 2022. There are also management and integration challenges. In May 2021, we found that NASA had not yet finalized roles, responsibilities, and authorities for Artemis, and NASA is currently in the process of reorganizing its Human Exploration Mission Directorate. It's too early to tell the outcome of this effort. Given the scale and complexity of the programs, it will also be important that NASA continue to hold integration reviews going forward to reconcile changes across the programs. In summary, NASA has made important progress on its Artemis efforts, but completing the lunar landing mission remains challenging. NASA will need to manage multiple risks seamlessly. NASA is undertaking a series of increasingly complex missions that rely on the su success of individual programs, as well as the agency to effectively manage and integrate across those programs. NASA has already experienced cost growth and scheduled de delays on the programs needed for Artemis I and Artemis II. Further delays and new technical challenges can have cascading effects for the later missions. It is important going forward that NASA continue to improve oversight of the Artemis missions and continue to take steps to establish mission and program costs, as well as further mature its integration and management functions. Chairman Beyer, Ranking Member Babin, Ranking Member Lucas, this completes my prepared remarks and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Russell, very much. We'll now hear from Ms. Sanders for her five minutes. Ms. Sanders, you have the floor. Um, yes, Chairman Beyer, um, we're Ranking Member Babin, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the subcommittee. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss this very important topic. Since its creation on October 1st, 1958, NASA has been responsible for some truly remarkable accomplishments. However, past achievement does not guarantee future success, and NASA has also had its share of failures. All of us here today are vitally interested in the success of Artemis, which NASA, faced with numerous challenges, constraints, and risks, will execute on behalf of the nation, but with the essential support of the administration, the Congress, and the overall national space community. The inherent challenges include Artemis is significantly more complex than the objectives of previous programs. That sustained lunar and Martian missions involve significantly greater risk than NASA's experiences in low Earth orbit. That the continually increasing pace of technological change requires sufficient flexibility to integrate advantageous achievements and advancements. That there is a need to integrate the contributions of a more diverse and innovative aerospace industry, both willing and able to make major contributions. And that there is an international community that would like to build on the International Space Station experience and continue to work with NASA. Our Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel has recommended some key steps that NASA and its stakeholders should take 
to meet the challenges, manage risk, and facilitate success. First, in the evolving environment with increasing commercial space capabilities and international interest in participating, NASA should take a strategic scrutiny of the role the agency intends to play going forward to best incorporate these to the advantage of Artemis while ensuring clear accountability for risk management. We emphasize the importance for NASA to strategically define its mission, its guiding principles, and its vision for the agency's leadership role in the future in order to ensure that risk is managed appropriately. Second, NASA should manage Artemis as an integrated program with top-down alignment and designate a program manager endowed with authority, responsibility, and accountability, along with a robust bottoms-up collaborative feedback process for both systems engineering and integration and risk management. Third, all the stakeholders, both internal and external to the agency, must be aligned to achieve the Artemis mission as a cohesive whole. NASA must clearly communicate its strategic vision and guiding principles, and these must be understood, embraced, and supported by all mission directors, center directors, and the workforce as a whole, as well as the administration and the Congress. Fourth, it is critical for both NASA and its stakeholders to establish technical baselines and schedules that are mutually consistent, realistic, and achievable, and that are supported by adequate and stable resources. And last, but by, by far not the least, and has already been noted by several of the members, we stress the requirement for constancy of purpose as essential to the ability of the agency to manage risk intelligently and proactively. Constant and abrupt changes in direction must be avoided. So as NASA looks to the future and moves to expand human knowledge and operational capabilities beyond low Earth orbit, it must recognize and adapt to a new environment and decide strategically how to forge humanity's path outward while managing the risks in an appropriate manner. The agency, in partnership with the Congress, should hold fast to the fundamental standards of risk management while embracing new approaches and not fearing alternative methods to achieve those fundamentals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, now we hear from Paul Martin. Our, um, the floor is yours, Mr. Martin. Thank you so much. Chairman Beyer, Ranking Members Babin and Lucas, and members of the subcommittee. Over the past two years, the Office of Inspector General has issued seven audit reports that examine issues critical to NASA's efforts to land humans on the moon as a precursor to a crewed Mars mission. This morning, I plan to highlight two of the most important challenges we identified through this oversight work, challenges we believe NASA must address in order to achieve its ambitious Artemis goals. First, controlling the program's enormous expense and technical risk. We estimate NASA will spend $53 billion on Artemis from 2021 to 2025. Moreover, we found that the first four Artemis missions will each cost $4.1 billion per launch, a price tag that strikes us as unsustainable. This $4.1 billion figure represents only production costs for SLS, Orion, and ground operations, and does not include the billions in development costs required to get the Artemis program to this point in time. Apart from its cost, NASA's initial three Artemis missions face varying degrees of technical risk that will push launch schedules from months to years past the agency's goals. With all necessary elements for the Artemis I mission now being tested at KSC, NASA is progressing toward the first launch of the integrated SLS Orion spaceflight system this summer. For Artemis II, NASA is facing delays due in part to the plan to reuse key Orion components. And for Artemis III, given the time needed to develop and test the human landing system and NASA's next generation spacesuits, we estimate the date for a crewed lunar landing likely will slip to 2026 at the earliest. Second, the Artemis program lacks transparency. 
Because NASA has not defined Artemis as a formal program under agency policies, no full Artemis-wide life cycle cost estimate is required. As a result, for fiscal years 21 through 25, the agency is relying on a rough cost estimate that excludes $25 billion it plans to spend for key activities related to missions beyond Artemis III. Absent a NASA-developed estimate, the OIG aggregated relevant costs across all mission directorates, and we project that NASA will spend $93 billion on the Artemis efforts from 2012 through 2025. We concluded that without NASA fully accounting for and accurately reporting the overall cost of current and future Artemis missions, it will be much more difficult for Congress and the administration to make informed decisions about NASA's long-term funding needs, a key to making Artemis a sustainable venture. To its credit, NASA has taken steps to help reduce costs and accelerate Artemis mission schedule, including modifying its procurement and program management practices. For example, NASA is obtaining HLS transportation services and the Gateway Spaceflight hardware using research and development contracts that more effectively leverage commercial capabilities. As NASA moves forward, it must accelerate these efforts to make Artemis programs more affordable. Otherwise, relying on such an expensive single-use rocket system will, in our judgment, inhibit, if not derail, NASA's ability to sustain its long-term human exploration goals to the moon and Mars. We look forward to assisting NASA in this ambitious and exciting undertaking. Thank you. Mr. Martin, thank you very much. And finally, we'll hear from Dan Dumbacher from AIAA. Chairman Beyer, Ranking Member Babin, Ranking Member Lucas, and distinguished members of the committee, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about complex space systems engineering, especially as it relates to NASA's Artemis initiative. As a former NASA program manager, I have led several major NASA programs, including systems in service today. Developing and operating space systems, particularly when human lives are at stake, require exacting engineering, our best talent, and persistence. This is risky business. Today's aerospace industry recognizes the need to move at a more rapid pace. The speed of innovation is increasing. Four important factors are needed to capitalize on the rapidly evolving capabilities in the aerospace sector. One, a clear strategy and focus for what is to be accomplished, why it is important with consistency over time. Two, a clear systems engineering approach serving as the glue to bring the program elements together. Three, a greater tolerance for risk at certain points in program development, assuring safety and balancing performance, schedule and cost. And four, development and growth of a talented workforce who will make the strategies reality. First and foremost, an organization needs an overarching, clear, communicable, and stable strategy. Such a strategy must describe goals and objectives and define the needed program elements. A well-developed strategy establishes the framework for the program elements to be developed in concert with the integrated whole and to safely operate. Space activities by their nature are highly complex. They require extreme reliability and safety and must be operable within the mass, cost, and schedule constraints. This requires a highly integrated space systems engineering effort to assure the needed elements physically operate together. Today, the commercial space enterprise adds an increased level of capability, economic opportunity, and potential to carry out the strategic objectives with less cost and more speed. This increases the need for clear strategic direction as the recently released NASA ASAP panel report correctly identifies. As the program elements are defined and developed, the following fundamentals are required. An understanding of how all the pieces of the program fit together, an understanding of how the system will operate and tolerate malfunctions and failures, establishment of options and backup plans to address risks and potential problems with on-ramps for new technologies and capabilities. This requires clear decision criteria, coordinated acquisition models, and risk acceptance decision processes and authority. A piecemeal, uncoordinated approach is doomed to failure. With these complex endeavors comes unknown and known risks. Program leaders must continually evaluate the overall progress and risk posture. 
This necessitates backup plans, options, and risk mitigation plans to assure potential to address potential influences and outcomes. And the team must remain curious and challenge the status quo to assure success. Undertakings such as the Artemis program require program elements and acquisition models be coordinated and integrated with shared information and clear leadership. The appropriate stakeholder and level must own the decision-making authority on risk acceptance and interface trades to meet safety, cost, and schedule requirements. Recognizing that safety, technical performance, cost, and schedules are all interrelated is key to success. Our tendency to avoid all risk at all costs and at all times must be tempered with the need to understand the limits of our designs and operations and grow our workforce and also to learn rapidly from a test in place of analytical perfection. Space exploration is a long-term endeavor and requires a broad view of the needed workforce. Career journeys will be built upon strategy and mission. Consistency of strategy is key to enabling the best and brightest to commit to space enterprise careers. We must continue to grow and enhance the talents of the workforce through inclusivity, capitalize on the various perspectives of our diverse demographic communities, and most importantly, continue to build a community where everyone is treated with respect and as equals. Team leaders at all levels, and especially the most senior levels, must remain vigilant and totally focused on executing and accomplishing the established strategy. Experiences taught us that successful organizations are laser focused on strategy and assuring the team has the necessary resources. In summary, it is my expert opinion that four crucial elements are required for successful complex space endeavors. A clear and understood strategy is critical. It underpins all decisions moving forward. Clear systems engineering and integration implemented as the glue that brings all of the elements together for safe operation. Risk acceptance appropriate for program phase must be managed at the proper level to remain in balance across all elements. And we must continue to grow and enhance the talents of the aerospace workforce. This process will take focused leadership, require hard decisions and clear communication. Our economic well-being and the generations to follow demand success. Thank you once again for allowing me to address the committee. I thank the committee for its continued support of our nation's space program and look forward to answering your questions. Mr. Dumbacher, thank you. And thank all of our witnesses for your excellent testimony. We'll now begin a round of questions. Uh, I'll begin to be followed by Ranking Member Babin. So the fact that we're even discussing the need for clear and agreed upon story of what we're doing, why and how we get there four years in the Artemis efforts cause for concern. We've heard this from virtually every one of you. Mr. Dumbacher, not to have you repeat the, the last five minutes, but why don't we have a clear strategy at NASA? And we, while you've outlined the elements, what will it take to move us from here, you know, many billions of dollars into Artemis to actually get to a clear strategy that we can all agree is a clear strategy? Uh, Chairman Beyer, I think uh, what is needed is a, a, a clear story and a clear understanding of of what those elements are uh, and what is needed and how those elements tie together. Uh, there has been the discussion about schedule and cost estimates. Uh, and also importantly is an understanding of how all of the elements will technically uh, fit together, particularly for the safe operation in the long haul. So I think that story is important. Uh, we need to, uh, I, I understand that the agency has been working hard on that. Uh, and working to get to that uh, to get to that communication for us all, uh, and we certainly look forward to hearing uh, what uh, the NASA team has has ahead for us. It certainly needs those key elements that we've all discussed. Thank you, Mr. Free. Let me pile on uh, two questions. First, what's the strategy look like? It, it, um, I'm Joe Citizen out there. Is, is it one page? Is it five pages? Is it a a 50 page white paper. Um, what, what do we expect this story to look like? And then, you know, we, we, I was amazed to find out that Artemis is not a program, that it's just a series of initiatives. This, this committee's last NASA authorization passed out a subcommittee would have established Moon to Mars initiative as a program. Do you agree that we should be doing that and should we should be pressing ahead? Yes, th thank you for the for both questions. So let, let me start with the, what, what your first one. What does the strategy look like? For me, it's it's very simple. Our ultimate goal is putting people on Mars, 
It's getting two people to Mars on the surface for 30 days, getting them there and back safely. Everything we do should be driven by that on the moon. That's what I've uh, seen from the team. That's what I've talked with the team about. That sets how long we need to stay on the moon. So we prove the systems out that we need to understand from a partial gravity environment. Um, that is what we use as everything that's driving how we're defining our architecture on the moon, defining and refining it. Um, your question about the program, I, I believe that in our new organization, we have set up uh, the Artemis campaign development uh, division, which will run all of our Artemis missions. There will be a mission manager for every single uh, mission, Artemis 2, Artemis 3, that will understand the requirements of the mission, the goals of the mission. We will be responsible for uh, tracking the hardware through its development and bringing it together for the operations uh, people in the space operations mission directorate to execute the mission. So from my perspective, and, and embedded in that is a strong systems engineering function. That Artemis campaign development division will have the, the budget, they will own requirements, and they will have the system engineering function to uh, bring the technical products to execute each and every Artemis mission. Jumping onto that, Mr. Free, NASA splitting his former human exploration operations mission director, long title, into two mission directors, including the one you oversee. I guess one for human exploration, one for operations mission. Um, how will this work now? Who's going to be in charge of Artemis and ultimately the authority over budgets and trade-offs between projects and all that? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Um, the the split was to, to really focus in on the execution of our, our programs, completing the development. The scope had grown greatly in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. This was to split it and have my organization focus on the development and have that budget authority over the development of the crew vehicle, of the lander elements over the suits. Um, and then as we uh, develop that hardware and get it proven through, through flights, uh, sometimes multiple flights, sometimes a single flight, we're, we're defining development that way, we hand off the operate to the oper operations mission director the the uh, control of those elements, and then my uh, organization in the Artemis campaign can, can continues to develop the new hardware we're bringing online, and define the missions to achieve our ultimate goals, which are tied to those two people for 30 days on the surface of the Mars safe there and on Mars safe there and back. Thank you, Mr. Free, very much. Let's move on then to our ranking member, Dr. Babin, for your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to start out with uh, Mr. Martin. Uh, your testimony estimates that SLS will cost $4.1 billion per launch uh, for at least the first four Artemis missions. During the shuttle program, there was a running joke that the first shuttle launch of the year cost $3 billion. All the rest of the flights are free. It doesn't look like that's going to hold. Wayne Hale, chair of the NASA Advisory Council's Human Exploration and Operations Subcommittee, wrote in 2019, if there is to be a program at all, a specialized skilled workforce dedicated to that program must be paid. Specialized facilities dedicated to that program must be maintained. And all of those things must be paid for. Never mind, however, how many times a year they are used. A real space program is not a buy by the yard kind of thing. The incremental cost of any additional shuttle flight was more realistically in the neighborhood of 200 million, not cheap, but a lot less than 1.5 billion figure that comes from the simple computation that throws in everything and divides by 135, which is the total number of shuttle flights. Uh, so Mr. Martin, if flight rates increased, how much would the incremental cost per launch be? Thank you, Mr. Babin. You know, yes, the sir. exact figure is unclear because part of it goes to the efficiencies that the underlying contractors like Boeing, which is in charge of developing the SLS core stage, the efficiencies that they make. Um, one of the problems we saw in development of the SLS and Orion, it's a challenging development, of course, but we did see notice very poor contractor performance 
on Boeing's part. There's poor planning and poor execution. We saw that the cost plus contracts that NASA had been using to develop the combined SLS Orion system worked to the contractors rather than NASA's advantage. And then for NASA's part, we saw poor project management and contract oversight. In fact, with ex for example, with respect to award fees, Boeing received 86% of all available award fees for the core stage development, despite being billions over budget and years behind schedule. So uh, if they improve their uh, accountability, then we'll certainly get the drive on that $4.1 billion cost per flight. Okay, well, how much of your assessed cost of SLS and Orion Fund Center uh, infrastructure uh, NASA, workforce, or other agency capabilities necessary to maintain a civil space program? How much? We broke it down. If you look on page 24 of our November 2021 report on the Artemis program, you'll see that we cost out $2.2 billion for development of a single SLS, the Exploration Ground System at $568 million, Orion at $1 billion and $300 million to the Europeans for the European Space Agency service module. You add that together and NASA check these figures and it's $4.1 billion. Okay. All right. So you arrived at it. Okay. Thank you. My next question is for Dr. Sanders. Uh, Ma'am, the uh, ASAP report states uh, NASA should assess the workforce, including the number, types, skills, experience, and responsibilities that, that will be required and the infrastructure facility requirements with a plan for managing changes needed to meet these, those requirements. And the report also states that NASA uh, should also uh, propose uh, general criteria for evaluating uh, make, manage, or buy decisions on future programs and projects. So when making those make, manage, or buy decisions, how can NASA ensure that they're conducting a true apples to apples comparison when some programs carry costs associated with NASA capabilities and some don't? Um, well, when we talked about NASA having a strategic vision, we talked more about, as much about deciding what NASA's role would be relative to the commercial industry and the international partners as we did about it knowing where it's going and what it's developing. And, um, and we were recognizing that there's a, a fundamental shift underway in the, in the space industry. Um, in the past, NASA owned the design, owned the requirements, owned the, um, the uh, development entirely itself. And now, um, in many cases, NASA owns the requirements and the accountability for the success of the mission, but not the design or the hardware. So we were, were talking about NASA having a fundamental understanding of how they manage that risk, how they, sh when they, they don't control all of the variables, um, but still are accountable, and we were talking, so when deciding what your criteria are for make, manage, or buy, um, you needed to take into account how you were going to manage the risk in each case and have the right criteria for that. Um, depends on how you intend to do the oversight, how you intend to do the insight, how you um, intend to operate in your, your, your acquisition strategy as a, um, a customer or as a partner. And those, those are fundamentally different relationships. And so we, we felt that was important. Um, it does bear on cost. Uh, our, obviously, our panel is focused on safety and risk management, but, but cost is, can't be ignored. Um, one of the advantages of being able to take advantage to incorporate commercially built um, and designed uh, components into the Artemis initiative is the fact that you ne do not necessarily have to pay for every part of the development if the commercial entity is developing it for other customers besides NASA. So for example, if, um, if the human lander is going to, in the components of the human lander, particularly the um, 
the launch vehicle are going to have other users, then NASA shouldn't bear the full cost of developing that, that part of the component. Um, but they still have to make sure it meets their requirements and that it meets their objectives. So it, it's a, it's a, a something that we, we believe NASA has to today evolved to through tactically managing the, the commercial resupply system, the commercial um, okay, um, yeah, I, I, I'm out of time, and I, I appreciate that very much. I have several other questions, but uh, we'll just have to submit those in writing. So I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Rabin. I mean, I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, but Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing, and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so my first question We'll go to Mr. Fee, but also want to hear from the Inspector General if he concurs with this. Our country over the last two years has been you know, severely impacted by COVID. We've seen time after time that companies are shutting down and now the supply chain is at risk in so many areas. Many of the figures that we've heard today uh, were developed either before or during much of this COVID. Can you reflect in a general way how you've taken into effect the COVID effect on both workforce and supply chain and how that's reflected in your numbers? Mr. Fee. Yeah, yes, thank, thank you for the question, uh, sir. I, I appreciate it. We, so uh, I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, the challenges we've, we've faced with COVID and storms. Um, uh, keeping the workforce connected. Obviously, we have a, a significant workforce that is um, hands-on when we're building vehicles. Um, we've kept our team connected and continued our design. So from, from my perspective, we that, that has continued and uh, not been a, a factor in, in increases in our, in our cost estimates. From a supply chain perspective, uh, perspective, I, I think we still are trying to understand that. Uh, we we are we we've had impacts before that. Just the the uh, the demand for components for space systems has increased greatly. The complexity of those systems has increased greatly. Um, so we had uh, supply chains that issues that were factored into our earlier estimates. From a COVID impact perspective, I still think that's that's TBD. Um, you've heard about a lot of the uh, the issues around chips. Uh, for us, it's around valves, it's around tanks. Um, all of those, I think, are are things that will we still have to figure out in the in the weeks and months ahead as we put our next budget submittal together. Thank you, Mr. Fee. And I should start out by saying to all those who stayed on the job during COVID, thank you. Literally kept things going, but. You'll be one of the only organizations that I have ever talked to that said they had virtually no impact on their bottom line. Uh, and with that, I'd like to ask our Inspector General, did, do you concur with the assessment that we just heard? Thank you, Mr. Norcross. Uh, I don't disagree. I think it is uh, uh, to be decided. So many of these components that are essential to the Artemis missions have such long lead times that the production and development began long before COVID. Um, but, but it's clear that, as Mr. Free pointed out, there have been a variety of challenges. And I would add an additional one, uh, legal challenges. When NASA awarded the contract for the human landing system, there was a series of legal challenges that stopped work on the, the award-winning contractor for seven months. And so there's a whole, even beyond COVID, there are many challenges. Thank you. Uh, just want to follow up uh, with uh, Ms. Saunders. When you talked about owning the risk, and I, I will use the term risk, uh, but plan, how do we not own the design plans? Having gone through, and, and on my committee deals with the F-35 on some of those very issues, when we sign away the ownership on some of this, we sign away a significant future for those parts and plans. Can you give us a little bit more clarity on what we will own versus what we won't? It will actually depend on, on how the contract acquisition is, is carried out. 
But in, for example, the experience they've had with the commercial crew program, um, and I think is, which is carrying forward into the human landing system, the um, NASA sets the requirements and they say, this is, this is what we need the system to do. And also the verification of meeting those requirements. But the, the provider designs and sets the design and the design may be set to meet more than one, more than NASA as a customer. Therefore, um, it's really important that the verification that they meet the requirements that NASA must have um, is, is well established and that, um, that there's adequate testing, adequate verification, ad adequate insight, oversight in order to make sure that, that NASA can then be accountable for the, the success of its mission. Thank you. Let's be clear. We end up paying for that design, whether we share it direct or indirect, those are included. And let us just not forget the software. Uh, yes. And owning that. With that, I see my time has expired and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rocross, very much. Let me now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the Honorable Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think all of you know that I strongly support NASA's efforts to return to the moon. Uh, I realize it's going to be expensive and I realize it's going to be hard, but I believe that it is worth the effort. And a part of accomplishing that shared goal is, as we've discussed uh, also in this hearing so far, the need for solid cost and schedule plans. So I ask this a question of the panel. I guess maybe the phrase would be, I survey this panel. And I know uh, Dr. Free, I believe, offered uh, 2025, but realistically, each of you, what is your estimate based on your vantage point and observations of this process about when we'll again land a crew on the moon? I believe, uh, Jim, you said 2025, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I did. Um, and and that's that's based on how I see the hardware coming together for the suits and the landers and Orion and SLS. Could I have the rest of the panel offer an observation about what year you realistically believe we'll put a uh, land a crew on the moon again? Yeah, I, let me. I know you jump in. Inspector generals tend to be a tad bit more pessimistic than the agency. That's what that's we're paid job. to do. Um, our current, based on our current work, is we say no earlier than 2026 citing the two um, developments that Jim mentioned, development of a human certified human landing system, as well as the next generation spacesuits. So no earlier than 2026, but could be a good bit later. Anyone else care to touch on that? Be brave. Sure, Congressman <laughs> Lucas, this is uh, Bill Russell from GAO. Certainly that's what we've seen in our work that even 2025 may be optimistic, given some of the challenges not the least of which would be getting the human landing system certified to operate spacesuits. Same thing still, um, there's a change in the acquisition strategy. So you're gonna have a contract award that you need to do this year. And there's still some technologies that are not mature, which often point to taking longer in development uh, to get there. So 2025 is, is um, not impossible, but it, it seems improbable given the current situation. Carefully worded. And our, our panel um, would probably echo that. We, we don't think it's impossible, but it's a stretch goal. Um, it's, it's sometimes good to have um, stretch goals in terms of your, your schedule, but you need to be realistic and all as well. And we also believe that you shouldn't let having a prescribed deadline kind of, of date cause you to make unwise decisions that impact the safety and success because you're just trying to meet that goal. Valid point. Uh, con yeah, Congressman, uh, I think uh, from our perspective, the 2025 date is certainly on the optimistic stretch goal side, and we would agree with that and certainly want to echo uh, Patricia's point on making sure that we uh, make good decisions along the way and not let schedule pressure force bad decisions. I think from our perspective, the 2025 to 2027 timeframe is probably realistic with the right focus, uh, the right resources. Uh, we uh, think it's certainly attainable in the 25 to 27 timeframe. 
Mr. Free, of course, we are clearly in this hearing highlighting the question about detailed plans and costs for Artemis. When will NASA send Congress a plan, including an integrated schedule and detailed cost estimates for the Artemis program? When will we see that? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, we we've uh, we we have our new organization that I mentioned with our Artemis campaign that uh, I'm counting on putting that uh, that mission manager in charge uh, to to put the integrated plan together. Um, we we've we've uh, uh, put together a plan that lays out through our uh, Artemis five, showing our our goals. Um, we have a longer term architecture that we're trying to. Uh, put the final details on by the end of this year. We're in the midst of our budget process right now to uh, that, that captures out through our, our landing, which will inform the president's budget uh, for, for 2024. Um, so all of those things, I, I just give you the list, not to defer to your, your question, but give you the list of how it's all lining up. But I feel it's my responsibility to put an integrated plan and budget together to show to getting us to that first landing. Well, clearly this is now a focus of the committee and our attention uh, will only increase. And I would offer the same observation to my colleagues on the committee, our responsibilities to do a NASA reauthorization bill are only increasing too. We have responsibilities also with specifications that will, uh, will help enable the Artemis project. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the whatever time I don't have. Thank you, Mr. Lucas, very much. And Mr. Lucas, we look forward to your input as we move forward on the authorization this spring and re reflecting many of your concerns. I, uh, I know you asked about how soon we put men and women on the moon. I now recognize the gentleman who will be concerned about when we put them on Mars, Mr. Porter from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll hold up my bumper sticker, which all of you have seen before. Um, that obviously has been some thanks, Frank, and uh, I concur with uh, Mr. Lucas's comments uh, about us, you know, doing our work and getting a NASA authorization bill to give direction to uh, the agency as to what we want to see, when we want to see it, why we want to see it, all that stuff. So we've got we've got our own work to do. Um, Mr. Free, I'm going to start with you and. Um, I liked what you said in your uh, opening remarks about, look, what we're doing here, and, and this was a conversation we had with Mr. Bridenstine when he was leading the agency, Senator Nelson, uh, since he's been leading uh, the agency, that for me at least, going back to the moon is the stepping stone to going on to Mars. And that really is what we wanna do. So, you know, if there is any schedule pressure, uh, Dr. Sanders, Mr. Dumbacher, it's 2033, okay? There's a lot of leeway in there. So my staff was concerned, though, in the written testimony of all of you, everybody's talking about the moon, like two, three times more than you're mentioning Mars. And so for me, I just wanna make sure, and I'd like you to kind of reiterate what you said, what is it that you're planning to do on the moon that'll help us get to Mars? That's what I want to see in any report that you guys prepare. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question and for your passion. Um, I, 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 I did mention our goal is to get on the surface of the moon so we understand how our systems operate in partial gravity. I'll give you an analogy. We tested systems for life support um, for a great deal of time on, on, the, on the Earth. And then when we put it in orbit, we saw a different uh, type of behavior because it was in microgravity. We are trying to uh, set our plans for the same thing, life support system, how the human interacts in partial gravity for, uh, for long duration. How we, uh, how we can use power systems that are common. When we talk about adding elements to our, our lunar architecture, it's, it's always about how does that play forward into what it can do on Mars. Obviously a lander is gonna be different because we have a, an atmosphere, but there are a lot of things that we could do from a, a rover perspective, from a spacesuit perspective, 
um, from a surface habitation element perspective that have great uh, parallels between the, the moon and Mars. So I, I'll go back to what I said, two people on the surface for 30 days, there and back safe to Mars, back drives everything we're gonna do. So when we feel confident that we have the runtime on the surface, and also I, I, I should mention Gateway, we plan on using Gateway as a platform to test our transit hab as well for extended durations to get that runtime. It's just like uh, building reliability in, in, in cars, right? We wanna build that reliability by operating time. That's what we're trying to get on the surface and on Gateway before we go on to Mars. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Martin, let me ask you, um, you know, when I, uh, earlier on, I wanna say it was probably about 2016, uh, in Sp we had a hearing with NASA executives and that's really when they said to me, look, the best time for us to get to Mars, making sure it's international in scope and public private partnership, because it's a big task, but the orbits are close and it saves space travel time. It's safer for our astronauts. At that point, they, I said, how much is this going to cost for us to get there 2033? And they said at that time, 2016, $200 billion. So this is not inexpensive. <laughs> Nobody ever said it is. So looking at that kind of big number, you said we've already spent 93 billion, but you, you took it back to 2012, if I heard your testimony correctly. I mean, where are we sort of as we, if, if 200 billion were that, were the right number back in 2016? So you're exactly right. The $93 billion was from 2012 through 25. And we picked 2012 because that was when the heavy duty work for the old constellation program began and several of the components, both the capsule and the rocket from Constellation have evolved into the SLS and Orion. So that's sort of why we chose the, those dates. We've done some work looking at potential Mars, uh, the cost of potential Mars missions. And, and to be honest, there's no reliable estimates out there about what such uh, a mission would cost. Um, as Mr. Free indicated, we're building, NASA's building capabilities, many of which they hope to use on an eventual Mars mission. So we will continue as an Office of Inspector General to look at both what they're spending now and, and how they're developing the equipment and the missions for the future. Okay, thank you. I see my time has expired and uh, I have, as you can imagine, a lot of questions. I'll yield back to the chair. Mr. Perlmutter, thank you for your steadfast Mars advocacy. Uh, we need you. Let me now recognize the, the gentleman who has the honor to represent Cape Canaveral, uh, Congressman Posey. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Byer. Uh, Congressman Perlmutter just asked a question that was of greatest interest to me, and that was the importance of sustained lunar exploration as a uh, precursor to human exploration on Mars. Uh, great answers. Uh, Mr. Free and, and then Mr. Dumbacher. Uh, China and Russia have their sights set on the moon and its resources with their amount of joint lunar base. Uh, given what the moon represents in terms of resources, prestige, U.S. national security, uh, what does the U.S. and NASA need to do to uh, guarantee the success of Artemis program in the coming years? Uh, yes, thank you, sir, for the, for the question. And Besides big checks. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for the question and thank you for your your workforce, uh, Representative Norcross asked me earlier about impacts. Um, there have absolutely been impacts from, from COVID on, on the workforce and, um, and I don't underestimate that. So uh, appreciate um, your, uh, your, the folks you represent that work so hard for us. Um, I, I think what we need to do, you know, there's published public data about when China plans to go to the moon, but I, I look at what I have to do every day is keep our focus on performance on our programs, uh, per setting a realistic schedule and budget and working to that, highlighting when we can't meet it and why, um, and, then, and then frankly executing it. I, I see that as my job and what I need to do every day. If I, uh, I, I, if I don't keep that focus, then I, I, I can't say that I'm giving my all to the effort that you all have uh, given us the resources to do. Um, we need to continue to expand our international partnerships um, through the Artemis Accords. The, uh, Romania signed the Artemis Accords at 
1030 Eastern today. So we continue to add international partners um, and we continue, we need to continue to take advantage of what the commercial industry provides us for our capability. Uh, thank you. And, and you just answered another question I had uh, next. Uh, for the record, what, what is the China-Russia uh, date? Uh, all, uh, the Chinese date, I think, is published to be later this decade. Um, Mr. Dumbacher, you want to add to that? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I think uh, one I've, one thing we're certainly seeing across the aerospace industry is this, uh, because of the uh, China and Russian activities, is a new is an increased urgency and an increased need for speed. Uh, and innovation. We have the commercial private industry that we can build upon. Uh, and with the, again, with the proper focus and the proper strategy in place that everybody understands and can, and we can get people making those, their important decisions at their appropriate levels uh, with, with that new urgency uh, and that consistency of purpose or constancy of purpose are, are how we're going to get there and how we're going to uh, get ourselves in, retain our leadership, and in fact, increase uh, the U.S. leadership in space. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Free, in your written testimony, you state Artemis will present new opportunities to deepen and broaden the international uh, Artemis coalition with, with China using its Belt and Road Initiative to expand its influence into outer space. What is NASA's plan to compete against this threat? Uh, does it include a proactive strategy, which you just touched on a minute ago, uh, to increase the number of countries and, and other partners to be part of the Artemis Awards. Um, yes, sir. So I, I mentioned Romania, and, and we're working with several nations on other contributions to uh, to Artemis, and and it it runs across the state the 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 spectrum from uh, early discussions about their desires to participate all the way through finalized elements uh, that, that you know of that are going on gateway for the IHAB, uh, the service modules we get today for the Esprit refueling module. Uh, we're talking with a potential partner about an airlock. So it's from small efforts to large uh, with several different uh, countries and entities um, all, at, all going on at the same time. So we look to continue to expand that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Posey. Uh, we only have one more questioner for this first round, but for those members who would like to hang in for a second round, please, please stay. And with that, let me recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairman Bayer and Ranking Member Babin and uh, Ranking Member Lucas. Uh, thank you very much for uh, holding this important hearing on Artemis program. As all of us are, I'm also a very proud supporter of our efforts to return to the moon and land humans on Mars. And I really want to thank the uh, witnesses for appearing before this committee today to speak on our progress on achieving that goal. And it's my hope that we will soon have a NASA authorization bill in the House. And I hope the, uh, the Space Subcommittee will have the opportunity to work with NASA and seek input from the industry stakeholders to produce a good and bipartisan reauthorization bill that supports our goals of getting to the moon and eventually to Mars. The Inspector General's report on NASA's management of the Artemis program states that $25 billion should be added to the Artemis plan's projected cost, which will bring the projected cost of the program to $93 billion for the fiscal years 2021 to 2025. And this report calls for increased price transparency and more realistic cost estimates and calculations of per mission costs. So Inspector General Martin, what explains the differences between your projected costs and NASA's projected costs of the Artemis program through 2025. And I know we're talking more, rather than 25, more realistic goal of 33. <laughs> Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, what's not included in that $25 billion or cost for um, 
uh, capabilities beyond Artemis III, and they include the gateway, they include development of the SLS Block 1B, also the exploration upper stage, the mobile launcher too. There's a whole series of capabilities that are being developed as we speak now that we total up to be approximately $25 billion that are not reflected in NASA's current Artemis cost estimates. You know, Inspector General Martin, so what can NASA do to provide more realistic cost assessment for the, uh, the Artemis program? I'm glad you asked that because we made that recommendation to them in our November report that you cited to it. We think that, that, that NASA, there should be an Artemis-wide life cycle cost estimate. And uh, it's sort of not completely clear to us why NASA has failed to agree with our recommendations. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, uh, an Artemis-wide cost estimate, life cycle cost estimate, would help increase transparency into the program. It would inform NASA's annual budget request. And I think importantly, it would provide a benchmark against which NASA can assess its cost-saving initiatives. Thank you. Um, you know, as we look to once again go beyond the low orbit, uh, low Earth orbit, I believe it is important that we do not forget the research in LEO that is required prior to sending astronauts into uh, deep space. The Inspector General's report on NASA's management of the ISS notes that several research programs dedicated uh, to human exploration in deep space will be incomplete by the time the ISS is deorbited. So while I am pleased to see that NASA recently released an update to the ISS transition plan, I am worried that NASA has not been specific enough on how it intends to continue conducting research into human systems, integration architecture, injury due to extravehicular activity operations, uh, space flight induced cardiovascular disease, space radiation exposure, and other critical low Earth orbit research activities when the transition is complete. So Mr. Free, let me ask you a question. Are you confident that NASA's ability to complete this research in time for future crewed Artemis missions? And how is NASA working with commercial partners and international partners who signed the Artemis of course to ensure those LEO research requirements are met? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, NASA has a, a robust research plan around its, uh, it for human research. Um, and to uh, buy down the risks for the systems for our long-term missions uh, to the moon and, and Mars. That is based in LEO. Today, we're doing a great deal of research on the space station of our systems that will actually uh, be used to fly to the moon and to Mars, uh, carbon dioxide removal as an example. Um, our plan to continue after the space station uh, life is complete is to work through our commercial LEO destinations that we just awarded three contracts for late uh, late last year, where we plan to continue to do our research that is dependent on microgravity um, that will continue from what we do on space station today. So we are not ending our time in low earth orbit when the space station life is complete. We're actually enabling that through our commercial LEO destinations and completion of our research plans. Thank you very much. I think my time's up. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Kim. And let me recognize Congressman Sherman from California for his questions. Thank you. Uh, this one's for the panel uh, to ensure we get the maximum value out of the capacity of the space launch uh, system. Uh, please discuss how NASA plans to take full advantage of the uh, space launch systems, the uh, SS, the SLS's capacities. Are you working with the science community and government uh, and other government agencies, particularly the Department of Defense, to uh, help take advantage of America's rocket? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. I'll I'll start, and and the rest of the panel uh, can can answer. Uh, we are, uh, as you know, SLS is really truly a national capability. Um, it has incredible lift uh, capability to. Uh, to low Earth orbit and enabling our lunar missions. Um, and we'll continue to expand that as we move through development of Block 1B um, in, uh, in the Artemis IV uh, mission set uh, today. Um, the access to that, to that rocket, we're looking to enable 
uh, through our exploration, production, and operations contract, um, other entities, both other government agencies, including the science community, to take advantage of of the capabilities of that uh, rocket. And eventually, our goal with our that contract is to lower the cost of SLS operations as well. Thank you, um, Mr. Martin. Uh, you frequently reported on the need to implement more effective contracting mechanisms to control costs and hold companies accountable uh, if there is poor performance. Uh, this seems reasonable. Uh, following your recent uh, reviews of the Artemis program, uh, can you elaborate on how tools like fixed price contracting uh, could help uh, keep the human landing systems effort within uh, Artemis uh, within budget? Uh, compared to other uh, contracting approaches. Thank you, Congressman. As NASA has moved a number of its spaceflight capabilities to a fixed price system, fixed price contract mechanism, and that makes sense if, but only if, the design for the system uh, is solidified. What we've seen even with fixed price contracts is they award a fixed price contract but then have modifications down the road that are often caused by NASA because the engineering and design work has not yet been solidified. So we're pro fixed price contracts, but they have to be appropriately used with a more firm design and engineering construct. That seems reasonable. Thank you very much. I yield back. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll now begin a second round of questions. Um, to Mr. Martin, in your role as um, overseeing NASA for all these years, uh, we've come up again and again with this whole notion of um, Artemis-wide life cycle cost estimate. Um, is there any sense that that would terrify the American public and shut down a program like this? That instead of looking at it as uh, X billion dollars per year, we looked at the whole life cycle cost and, uh, and then robbed it of its political salience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the politics of it, I will leave to you and the members of the committee and the rest of, of Commerce. Uh, we just think operationally and strategically, it's a NASA's best long-term interest to have an idea when they're presenting whatever, be it Artemis or be it the James Webb Space Telescope, if they have as a, 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 a detailed and as accurate a life cycle cost estimate. So you know what the American taxpayer is buying. I mean, there's opportunity cost. If you buy, for, let's use James Webb, for instance, uh, it costs over $10 billion. It, we're not making a value judgment at the Office of Inspector General whether it's a $10 billion, it's worth the $10 billion. It may very well be worth $20 billion. That's not our within our purview here at the Office of Inspector General. But that came in many years ago, uh, approximately a as a $1 billion was presented to Congress as a $1 billion project, okay? And then ballooned over the years. Uh, it is a one of a kind instrument, I get, I get that. But it ballooned over the years to $10 million. There's opportunity costs by Congress appropriating and NASA spending that $9 billion deficit on the James Webb Space Telescope. There are other things it couldn't do. So I think an overall, as accurate as possible, life cycle cost estimate uh, should be sort of baseline for these major programs. Thank you very much. Mr. Dumbacher, you've been on all sides here, including a uh, professor at Purdue. Um, there's a fascinating piece called Good, Good NASA, Bad NASA by a guy named James Miggs that I read over the weekend. He talked about how NASA had done incredibly good work on things like the space telescopes uh, and, the, and the, the, all the science stuff. Um, but had just spent endless amounts of money year after year through the major contractors, the Boeings, et cetera, um, making virtually no progress on human exploration. The, does the Elon Musk experience, the development of Starship, the, uh, the ability to go back and forth for what seems to be a fraction of the cost of NASA, um, push us in the direction of privatizing more of NASA? Um, and, and how does that feed into the debate about who should own the assets at the end? Assets to the American people have paid for. Well, that's a very interesting uh, question, Congressman. I will do my best to, to do it in a short form. Uh, I think uh, 
the opportunity that the commercial private space enterprise companies provide us, uh, one is they are a, a, a new level of competition that we haven't had in the past that or in recent memory that uh, has turned and has proven to be beneficial. Uh, they also bring forward that efficiency, uh, thinking through how we can do it more efficiently while retaining our safety and our technical performance. Uh, I think uh, those are all valuable lessons that should be that should be continued. Uh, what we and how we can apply that to the future is, as NASA moves forward and in, in the and we consider the the typical or the expected role of the government investment to reduce the risk for private industry to then come in behind the government and to make uh, and to pick up make it a, a market potential and get the cost efficiency and the speed into it. Uh, we are going through that transition for the first time uh, from a human spaceflight perspective, similar to what the commercial airline, commercial aviation industry did back in the 40s and 50s. So what we have to learn uh, forward is that uh, we need to work through that transition. We need to think through that transition and importantly, value the taxpayer investment because that taxpayer investment and the knowledge from it provides the necessary basis for the emerging econ economic opportunity down the road. So uh, we have the opportunity with in the launch vehicle industry because of the investments that the government has made in the past, they are now coming to commercial fruition and we can begin to apply those. We have to be diligent though of making sure we protect uh, and, and the knowledge base so that the taxpayer investment can be, can be utilized uh, across the board. Uh, and also recognize that at times, and we have experience doing this, also recognize at times that we will have to protect uh, commercial investment when, they, when the commercial entities uh, also provide some funding. So, this is a balancing act. It's a, it's a complicated transition that we're going through for the first time. Uh, and I think we're learning, we're learning and we're seeing good progress and there's opportunity out there. We just have to be cognizant and conscious about the hard decisions. Thank you, Mr. Novak, very much. Uh, now let me recognize uh, Dr. Babin for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad we're going back through it a second time. <clears throat> I've got a couple more. That I was not able to get to. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, go to Mr. Free uh, and ask you, will there be one mission control for Artemis, SLS, Orion, and HLS, or will there be a separate mission controls and mission operations centers like there are for ISS and the commercial operations? And if there's just one, where will it be located? And uh, if there will be several, where, where, where will they be located as well? Oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Babin. Actually, I'm down here at uh, JSC right now, a place yes, you're sir. familiar with. And it was a pleasure. Uh, I'm sure you meet a lot of folks. It was a pleasure to meet you at the astronaut candidate uh, yes, uh, induction. Um, and so right. from a mission control, mission control perspective, we have mission control in Houston, which will be the hub for all of our activities uh, around Artemis. Um, there will be uh, mission control for our, from our HLS uh, provider <clears throat> that, that mission control here in Houston will connect with. Um, SLS has a, uh, a control center where they look at all the data for SLS, but the central control for us will be here in Houston whenever we put uh, the crew on there. That's, that's where we focus our efforts. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That's good news, and, uh, and great to see you as well, again as well, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, also, one, one last question for you. NASA recently initiated an effort to reduce the cost of SLS and Orion by 50%. What is the status of this review, and is the goal reducing 50% of the cost of contracts are the overall programs, uh, including NASA's portion of the programs. If you could elaborate on that a little bit, I would appreciate that. Yes, sir. That's our expir exploration production and operations contract effort. Um, <clears throat> that is uh, currently being uh, set up and evaluated through our procurement process internal to the agency. 
Um, that, so that's, that's ongoing with uh, near-term activities uh, underway, trying to get to that as fast as we can. The focus is on beginning that with Artemis V. Um, I talked earlier about the change between development and operations. Um, that's where we're looking at making that switch. Um, the focus of that contract is to work the contractor side to get that 50% reduction on everything we have with the multiple contracts we have um, around um, the space launch system and uh, today. Um, and we, of course, will always look at our side of the equation also of can we do things differently to lower our cost and um, and our, our, our general operations to work with the contractor. If we give them that contract, that's going to change how we interact. Um, that also means we need to make sure that that workforce has work to go to as well. Okay, thank you so very much. And I really appreciate it. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, Jim, thank you for your service too. Thank you, Dr. Babin. We may recognize um, the, the, perhaps the first Congressman to represent Mars, Mr. Perlbein. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and my questions uh, are gonna go to you, Mr. Russell, Mr. Martin, and Dr. Sanders, just to, and then anybody else. It's sort of more of a philosophical, kind of a overall kind of a thing. You, Dr. Sanders, you talk about the need for a strategic vision. We are in a moment now, and, and this goes back to the beginning of uh, you know, our space flight and where we were in serious competition with Russia. And you know, President Kennedy and President Eisenhower said, okay, we got to get busy here. And it was a civilian and a defense effort. So my questions, and my question generally is, has there been any discussion as you're doing sort of a budget analyses, as you're thinking about the strategic vision, what role the defense department may play in all of this as we're going back to the moon, as we move towards Mars. So I guess it's just a very, and I want my chairman and my ranking member to be thinking about this. You're not gonna have me around for a long time. And I have been talking to the Armed Services Committee about the need for us to consider this. So I'll yield first to you, Dr. Sanders. Okay. Um, a little bit outside of the, the lane, but one of the things when we talk about um, the hazards of space exploration, we always talk about balancing the value of what you're undertaking with the risks that you're that are attendant with it, because you're never going to eliminate all the risk. And anything that can help you manage that risk better, including partnerships with the Department of Defense, um, would certainly be a, a potential positive there. The other thing is, is that um, leadership, the nation's leadership in space is an important aspect of our leadership in across the spectrum. And so a cooperation wherever it, it's possible between defense and, and NASA is, is certainly a welcome thing. Thank you. And so I guess to Mr. Russell, Mr. Martin, in your sort of calculations, and um, do you guys ever consider the potential that part of the budget of getting back to the moon, part of the budget of going to Mars uh, could be borne by uh, the Defense Department? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I, I would turn back to what Dr. Sanders was just mentioning about the overall goal is to mitigate that risk. And if you can leverage government resources, whether it's within NASA or DOD to do that, um, that would be beneficial. So one element to that is using mature technology. So if DOD in their realm and their programs, they're very active in space, has uh, a key technology that could help enable or, or technology uh, improvement effort that could help enable what NASA is doing. Certainly leveraging that across the, uh, the federal enterprise would be a, a smart move. But that's the, the main thing, just wherever you can leverage some of the DOD knowledge to help mitigate the risk in putting together the, the Artemis mission set. Uh, 
uh, would be beneficial in my view. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Congressman. I will respectfully dodge the question, if that's okay, but uh, only to underscore a theme that's emerged through this hearing, is both from the panel of witnesses as well as the members, is constancy of purpose. I've been here at NASA OIG for the last 12 years, and we've seen one of the more problematic things for NASA long term is when the national strategy lurches uh, from one excuse me, from one uh, pole to another. And we saw that with the cancellation of Constellation and then the asteroid retrieval mission, and now we back at Artemis. And so when you lurch, uh, NASA takes years to build capabilities uh, and billions of dollars in infrastructure, and we cannot leave those kind of investments on the table. No, and I, and I thank you for that. I'll yield back after, after this, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I mean, I think what we've got to do from a, a congressional standpoint is just also, you know, take advantage of other budgets that will benefit by the work that we're doing to get back to the moon, to have commercial on the moon, and to get to Mars, because we know we are in competition with China, with others, and you know, sometimes uh, even though we try to keep the civilian side and the defense side separate, there will be a benefit to the defense side is what I'm talking about. We should be able to take advantage of their budget a little bit since it's about 100 times bigger than NASA's. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter, very much. Um, and thanks also for the feedback on the constancy of purpose. Remember in 2016 at a space committee subcommittee hearing asking the NASA administrator, this is uh, three administrations ago, what the constancy of purpose was at NASA. He had a one word answer, Mars, which, which he then re revised a few minutes later to say science, but they're <laughs> both in the right realm. And before we bring the hearing to a close, thank all of you for hanging in there for almost two hours and for testifying and being prepared for this. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of witnesses. We have much to do this year, NASA reauthorization, lots of work on space situational awareness and how we manage low Earth orbit traffic. Uh, but we always want to keep the, the Artemis mission, the initiative and someday a program right at the top of our priorities. So thank you, the witnesses are excused. The hearing is now.